Welcome to the Self Girl Nerds Podcast. I'm your host, Marie, a courage coach, creative soul, and adventure seeker. Since through hiking the Pacific Crest Trail in 2019, I'm on a mission to help you embrace your most confident self so you can achieve your dreams too. If you're eager for deep conversations, big questions, and meaningful connections, join me on the quest to discovering how we can create a more magical and memorable life. Hello, nerds! How are you? I'm doing really good. Today we are talking about 10 tips for playful time management. So it's a fun episode. I'm not someone who's going to tell you how to optimize your days for productivity, how to do it all. No, it's quite the opposite. Think like Peter Pan slash Pippi Longstocking slash Swiss Family Robinson. I want you to have time to daydream, to clean your house with... What What did she have? Like brushes on her feet? I want you to chat with your horse and have time to go on adventures. I think you get the gist. I definitely prioritize having an enjoyable journey rather than getting there as fast as possible. So we've got 10 tips to cover. Some of them are mindset related and some of them are more practical. Number one, rebel against the culture we live in. The hyper productive capitalistic system is, in my opinion, broken. I mean, I shouldn't even say in my opinion, because there are facts. The number of people who are burning out, who are depressed, is way higher than ever. This way of living, where you get up, you get into your car, you drive to your office, you spend all day in the office, and then you get back home, and you watch TV, and you watch your phone, and then you go to sleep, and then you do it all over again, is not natural. We're animals at the end of the day. We need to spend time outside. We need to connect. We need to spend time with the people that we love. We need to laugh. We're not machines. Although we are expected to function like machines. And if we don't function like machines, we are told that we are the problem. And that's what I'm suggesting we all rebel against. You're not the problem. The system is the problem. And the reason why I think it's important to rebel against it is that then you're going to stop feeling guilty. Guilty for resting, for example. Guilty for not doing as many hours as your colleagues do. It takes courage to refuse to work as much as other people might do because you're going against the current. Instead of feeling guilty for taking it easy, for taking care of yourself, I suggest you start finding pride in that because you're helping create a new culture that's more humane. I remember a conversation with a client. She was telling me uh, she was working about 30 hours a week, but logging in 40, and she felt guilty for lying. She said, "I, I really need to tell my bosses the truth but I know that if I do they're just going to give me more work and I don't want to do more work I like those extra 10 hours that give me room to breathe so we talked about how as long as she's doing the work that she's being paid for that's all that matters and I don't know about you but I choose to believe personally that it can be okay to lie when you're stuck in an oppressive system and your goal is to protect your well-being. This first tip is all about bringing a sense of mischief to your day-to-day. For example, go take a bath in the middle of the day. Write emails from your bath or take a nap when it feels wrong to take a nap because culture says you should be sitting at your desk from 9 to 5. You can rebel against that. And look for other playful ways to disrupt the established order. Just like a kid would if they're in a family where their parents are super strict. Kids would look at them weird and try to test the boundaries. They would ask questions and they would say, that doesn't make sense. Let me do this instead. I'm aware it's easier said than done because it comes with risk. Rebelling against an oppressive system always does. Someone I know lost their job over telling their boss that the way they were doing things was wrong. 
Of course, that's not ideal and you might be in a situation where that's the last thing you want, but it can also be a great act of courage. Anyway, that is a conversation for another day. This episode is supposed to be a lighthearted list of tips. So we're going to move on. But yeah, you could find small, subtle ways to bend the rules. Tip number two, unshame ease all the way into your core. But Marie, what do you mean? I'm going to read a quote from John Acuff in his book, Finish. And you're going to understand exactly what I mean. He writes, quote, for something to count, it has to be difficult. A lot of high performers carry that sort of secret rule along with them. If an exercise is enjoyable and you have fun doing it, it must not count. We have glorified being busy and working hard, but to the benefit of whom? What if you decided to allow your life to be easy? Constantly ask yourself, how can I make this easier? Because if you're overwhelmed a lot of the time, I can almost guarantee you that it's because part of you is overcomplicating things. Yes, you might have a lot on your plate, but the way you approach what's on your plate might be more complicated than it needs to be. So ask your creative brain, how can I make this easier? Then you know what? If the task takes you 15 minutes instead of an hour, it's okay to celebrate and do something fun instead of working on the next task. You can keep working if you're in a role, but it's also okay to just step away for a bit. If you write a song in 15 minutes and people love it way more than the one you spent five days trying to put together, then that's wonderful. Let that be wonderful. I just had a session with a client of mine who uh, she was telling me she spent the whole weekend trying to finish a task and then it was hard, it felt rigid, it felt like a slog fest. And then on Monday morning, she got up, she got it done really fast, really easy. And she made it easier by removing all distractions, by not trying to make it perfect, by being really clear on what the goal was and putting the mind drama aside. If you're someone who's always identified as someone who works hard, you can shift that identity. You can start telling yourself, I'm someone who chooses to nap instead of push through because I care about my well-being more than about producing results. And don't get me wrong, I'm a hard worker. I love being a hard worker. But I also take really good care of myself and I know I've developed the ability to say, oh, now I've crossed the line and what I'm doing is is not having any more impact. It's just busy work. And tip number two is also about not shaming yourself when something that you do comes naturally to you. If you're in your zone of genius and something just pours out of you that would take someone else two hours, but it takes you 15 minutes, then that's just as valuable. I remember helping a client plan a a workshop and I remember thinking, oh my God, this is so much fun. I feel guilty for getting paid for this. Meanwhile, my client was having a great experience because that's something that she struggled with and her way of making it easier was to hire someone for whom it was, instead of telling herself, no, I should be able to do it on my own, instead of being stubborn. Actually, that's not in my list of tips, but it should be. Hiring someone who can help you save time. Bonus points if you love them. Franz, who does the editing of this podcast, she's super enjoyable to interact with, and having her by my side is saving time and adding meaning and joy to my life. The same way that working with me has been an efficient as well as a fun way for my clients to save time. Saving time on a small scale because I, for example, teach them tools to manage their emotions so there's not as much emotional instability in their day-to-day And that allows them to focus on what really matters instead of trying to 
calm themselves down all the time. And also saving time on a bigger scale instead of spending years stuck in a relationship or a job that leaves them feeling unfulfilled. We make a plan and they start taking action to shift their life trajectory sooner rather than later. And so they start feeling better in a matter of weeks or months instead of years. Okay, moving on to tip number three. Tip number three is going to seem contradictory, but bear with me, you'll understand what I mean. Tip number three is to choose the long run and reject urgency culture. Sometimes I think one of the big reasons why we struggle with time management is that we have unrealistic expectations of how long a project should take. Let's say you want a said project to take four weeks and it, it requires like 15 hours every week in order to get it done within a month. You struggle to fit those 15 hours in your week. You feel really tired at the end. Maybe what you need to do here is not get better at fitting in these 15 hours, but instead just extend the timeline and decide, okay, I'm going to get that done, but it's going to take eight weeks. And I know some of you work in companies where the timeline is imposed onto you. You have no control over it other than maybe talking about it with your manager. But this still applies to other aspects of your life, your personal projects, uh, your, your, your personal goals. Sometimes we're in a rush to reach a certain destination because we're running away from our current discomfort. I made a whole podcast episode about this. It's called When You're in a Rush. You can go and listen to it. By trying to run away from your current state, you're creating more stress than necessary. You're making the journey unbearable. Instead of looking at how you can find peace with where you're presently at. Let me give you a concrete example. Let's say you're starting as a freelance designer. And you're feeling the urgency to have a large number of clients or to get big clients because it makes you seem more legitimate. So what happens is you might hustle, might work hard and not take really good care of the client that you do have in the moment. Instead, you can tell yourself, I'm in this for the long run. I'm here to stay. So there's no rush. I'm going to get there eventually. I'm going to be this renowned designer that I dream of being eventually. But in the meantime, let's just do the work we have in front of us and do it well. In a situation like this one, you're in a a rush simply because you feel shame about being a beginner. Shame is a big driver of urgency culture. We're ashamed of not being as good or as perfect or as rich as we think we should be. We reject who we are and where we are in our journey. And what I suggest here is to just boldly own it. If you're starting out in business, it just makes sense that you have one or two clients or zero clients. You're learning the ropes. There is no need to hide that, to pretend that you're successful right off the bat. We have such high expectations of ourselves of what we need to achieve in order to be worthy, but you're already worthy. You don't need to achieve anything. This is all just a game. We're just trying things. When you operate from a foundation of solid self-worth, then you'll be more able to chill, to take the scenic route, and to get there eventually, maybe, instead of being stuck in the traffic jam because you're trying to get as quickly as possible to the place where you will feel worthy. That is just not sustainable. Personally, what I do when I feel myself feeling impatient, feeling like something should move at a faster pace, is ask myself, what's the rush? What's the harm in slowing down right now? I remind myself I'm in this for the long run. It's going to happen eventually if I want it to. Sometimes you just got to let go and let things take the time that they will take without trying to control, without trying to micromanage the universe. Okay? Wow, I'm 
up on my soapbox today. Tip number four, remove everything that is out of alignment. What I suggest that you do here is what I call an intuitive life inventory. So very simple. You make a list of all the things you spend your time doing in your day-to-day life. So that can be uh, your job, the people you hang out with, the activities that you take part in, the projects that you're working on. And then you're going to take one item after another and you're going to scan your body, see how you feel about that specific item. You can ask yourself the question, does this belong in my life and pay attention to the sensations, to the physical sensations. Is this a full body? Yes. You can take one of your favorite activities and see how it feels in your body. For me, it's the podcast. I know that the podcast is a full body. Yes. So I can tell you, oh, for me, it's like um, there's no resistance whatsoever. It's a, a clear channel. When I think about the podcast, it's a clear channel in me. So figure out what your full body yes feels like and then see um, how the other ones compare. There will be some that maybe you want to keep in your life, but there needs to be some adjustment. And then there will be other items where there's resistance, items that you don't choose to spend time on wholeheartedly, but that you spend time on from a place of people pleasing. I had a a client of mine, she was working on a project with a friend and she was forcing herself to do so. And I could sense from the way she was talking about it that that's one of my strengths, seeing where you're out of alignment and calling you out on it. And when I called her out on it, she said, well, I can't leave because I told my friend I would X, Y, and Z. And if I leave, she's going to think those negative things about me. So she was staying not from a place of desire but from a place of obligation or she felt obligated and she was afraid that she would disappoint others if she did what she truly wanted. If you think you can't get rid of something it probably means that you ought to. That is if you want to live a life that feels lighthearted, that feels like home. You're going to have to learn to face loss. Your ability to say no to everything that you feel internally is a no is going to have a massive impact on your level of well-being. And sometimes that also includes what you have already started, but you've changed your mind about. Maybe a past version of you was aligned with this decision and now it no longer reflects who you are in the present. Maybe you keep working towards a past self's dream. And that is going to take you further and further and further away from your truth. You've got to be able to let go of decisions you've made in the past in order to figure out who you are in the present and in order to make space for what you want right now. A big part of that is leaving denial. Be honest with yourself about what no longer belongs in your schedule. And if you don't yet have the courage or the ability to stop doing one of these things, then at least tell yourself the truth. For example, I still hang out with that friend because I don't have the courage to break off that relationship yet. Or I am still, I'm going to stay at my job for another six months because I'm working towards a savings goal that's going to give me the space to look for another job. I don't know. I'm making this up as I go. You get the gist. Be honest with yourself instead of remaining passively in a state of dissatisfaction. And if you need a hand, if you need help removing everything in your life that's out of alignment, let's work together. The client I was just telling you about in the first two months of us working together, that's basically what we did every week. Every week, we would talk about one of the things that she needed to let go of, and I would help her get there psychologically and emotionally, because the logistics of it are just a small part. The big part is giving yourself permission and feeling okay, feeling like it's safe for you to move forward and to listen to what you really want instead of complying to the shoulds, complying to your good girl conditioning. 
What happens once you remove everything that's out of alignment is that what you have decided to keep becomes so much more meaningful. If instead of seeing my 15 different friends, I choose to focus on three of them, I can make those three relationships so much deeper, right? Everything that you choose to do has a reason for being that you can stand behind. You're no longer being pushed around. You don't feel like you're being pushed around anymore. You have consciously chosen all the different parts of your life and that is going to make your life feel so much more fulfilling. But it does take a massive amount of courage. As I record this episode, I'm thinking it shouldn't be playful time management, but courageous time management. You've got to be courageous in order to get to a place where your life feels playful. Now, tip number five is a little bit more lighthearted. Hire a kind but firm inner manager. Sometimes our brains are like a a bunch of toddlers going in different directions and we need like a to hire a kindergarten teacher that's loving but good at bringing in order. I see too many people going through their weeks feeling overwhelmed, having like a a to-do list that just keeps getting bigger and bigger and they just try to concur the to-do list a little bit more every day. And it never ends. It's just stressful and uh, there, there, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. You just keep telling yourself, oh, it's going to get better next week. But next week, more stuff appears on the to-do list and it's uh, exhausting. It has been multiple years since I have completely let go of a having an oppressive to-do list that follows me around. And it's been one of the best things I've done for my peace of mind. What I do instead, and I'm going to try to summarize it because I mean, I've done whole courses on that, is to divide what needs to be managed in categories. I use Notion as a as a free app. Divide by categories. And if you're going to have lists, they're going to be organized. And then I plan every week based on those lists, either on Friday or on Monday morning. I choose my priorities and I time block them in my Google Calendar. You can also use an agenda if you prefer paper. I have color-coded time blocks because I think it looks fun. It makes my week look super colorful. And all the little tasks that take like 5, 10, 15 minutes, I gather them in admin clusters. So let's say on Wednesday, I'm going to put a one-hour admin time block and that's where I'm going to get a bunch of little tasks done. Then once that's done, that's the the, the manager has done their job, you become the employee and all you have to do is follow what's on the calendar. And you don't have to be super rigid. There can be flexibility. Imagine a, a healthy relationship between an employee and a manager where the manager is like, I trust you to do what Uh, we've decided was important. You can do it in the order that you want. This is just like a general structure to follow. So if the manager has put like a time block that says, write chapter two of your book on Tuesday from six to eight, maybe you'll do it later in the day instead. That's okay. As long as the, the manager can trust you. And that's something you might have to develop with time. It's something I work on with my clients when they've had a history of giving up on themselves, then they have to rebuild a relationship of trust. But that's okay. That's something you can definitely do. And what is amazing with that way of working, so having the manager plan your week and then having the employee follow what's been planned is that you don't stress as much because you know things are going to get done. Unless you have planned too much and it's unrealistic. But once your inner manager has a a better understanding of your inner employee's capacity, it works really well. And you can always adjust depending on the season of life that you're in. Uh, You can tell your manager, um, right now I'm going through a rough time because I just separated from my partner, for example. And then if the manager is kind, they will adapt their expectations of you. And you might tell me, well, Marie, this doesn't really apply in my situation because I 
work for actually a real manager that has really high expectations all the time, then what I would suggest, and I don't know your specific situation, but broadly, I would say communicate with them. And if it's already been done and there's no way to meet each other's needs, then I would suggest starting to think about your exit, starting to plan your exit. And if that seems like a daunting task, I can help you with that. You can book a call with me and we'll talk about how we can make that feel doable. Because if you're evolving in a space that doesn't care about your well-being, that's just not good for you. And the kindest thing you can do is get out as quickly as you can. Okay, two more things I want to share when it comes to hiring an inner manager. One is you have to plan, maybe not for worst day you, but for at least average day you. What I see most people doing is that they think about their ideal version of themselves and then they plan for that version of them. And that leads them straight into a wall of disappointment. I would suggest that if you have a tendency to overestimate what you can do in a given day, plan for your idea of you at your worst. Make it seem super doable and you'll surprise yourself. You'll surprise yourself at how good it feels to set reasonable standards. When you love yourself, you want to set yourself up for success. So you want to get to the end of the day and the end of the week feeling like, oh my God, I was able to do all of this. How awesome. And the way to do this is to set the bar low. And then in the end, you might even do more than you had expected because you feel good. Try it and see. And if you feel resistance, as I tell you this, it might be because you've got to go back to Tip number two, which was unshaming ease. What's wrong with making things easy? You think you're just going to get lazy and not get around to doing much? Actually, quite the opposite will happen. When you are able to jump over the bar, then you have the energy to jump over a lot more bars. Versus when the bar is really high and it takes an enormous amount of effort to jump over it, then you're exhausted afterwards. Last piece of advice for the inner manager that you're going to hire, I suggest they celebrate your progress. (laughs) So what I love to do is keep a progress tracker. And I don't do it as strictly as I used to in the beginning, because in the beginning I needed the motivation that comes from seeing my progress more. But what I would do back then is sit and write down my progress every Friday, and I would do that with a beer. If you love beer, get a beer. If you love stickers, get stickers, whatever is going to make it more fun. We're still kind of children at heart. So we've got to speak to that part of us. We've got to make sure that that part of us is on board with the goals we're striving towards. Hence why I'm a big, big, big advocate of self-celebration. Okay, tip number six. It's a short one. Clear the clutter before you start. Do a morning brain dump. So if you wake up and you feel anxious, you feel scattered, you've got to sit with your journal and get it all out of paper. Because you're like a computer hard drive that's cluttered with heavy files. It's not going to work well. It's going to be slow. So you want to clean up that hard drive first if you want your day to, to go well. If you want your day to feel playful. Get it all out of your system. Ask yourself questions like, what is stressing me out? What is this really about? You can go back to the uh, episode two weeks ago, figuring out the root cause of your anxiety and then address it instead of letting it drive your day. Ask yourself, what do I need right now in order to feel better? And if you think you don't have time to take 15 minutes to do that, then you're probably in the place where you must take the time. Otherwise, something in your day that could take you one hour is going to take you four because of all the mind drama and all of the challenging emotions that are getting in the way and you're going to feel exhausted at the end. Okay, tip number seven, replace habits with rituals. In his book Effortless, the author Greg McEwen talks about how 
Rituals are habits with a soul. What you do is you attach small fragments of wonder to a mundane task. He writes, quote, Rituals make essential habits easier to sustain by infusing the habits with meaning. So let me give you an example. Me brushing my teeth in the morning and the evening is just a habit. I do it because I have to do it. I don't really think about it. Versus when I make my coffee and go to drink it by the window in the morning, it's a ritual. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. The attention that you bring to what you do. Sometimes I'm going to clean my house as if it's a habit. And then sometimes I'm going to clean my home as a ritual. The difference is in the energy and the beliefs that you hold as you do it. So if I clean my house out of habit, I just, I'm just moving through a task because I want to get from point A to point B. If I'm cleaning my home as a ritual, I am doing so from a place of gratefulness to live here, from a place of wanting to take care of myself. It makes me think of Judith Gatton, a style coach that I love. She says that when you're getting undressed at the end of the day, sure, you can get undressed, but you can also disrobe. And it's the same thing. It's just that you do it differently. Instead of leaving your clothes in a pile on the floor and putting on a big t-shirt and getting straight into bed, you might decide to hang your clothes in the closet. You might take a moment to look at your body in the mirror and moisturize it. Then you might put on a pajama that feels really comfortable. And then you might slip into your sheets with a book. Maybe pay more attention to the lighting, the smells. You might light up a candle. And we don't want to do this with every aspect of our lives. That would be pretty intense. But have fun taking one habit and seeing what it could look like if you turned it into a ritual. And chances are you'll have a much easier time upholding the habit when you bring more meaning to it. The idea behind playful time management is that you stop taking yourself so seriously and doing everything from a place of this has to be practical, this has to be productive. We want to bring in a bit of magic and joy in your day to day. This leads me to the last three tips, which are rapid fire questions. So questions you can ask every day to lighten up the mood. Tip number eight comes from one of my former roommates. When I would wake up and complain about the day ahead, he would say, you know what? Today might surprise you. Keep your eyes open. So that's something you can do as well. When you have apprehensions about what's coming up in your schedule, ask yourself, hmm, in what way might today surprise me? You might not come up with an answer right away, but it might send you out into the day with a more open mindset. Tip number nine, when you wake up feeling heavy, ask yourself, where is the joy today? See how you can follow the bliss a little bit more, to quote Joseph Campbell. Actually, I have two more versions of this same question coming from different people. Just take the one that resonates the most. One of my mentors, Simone Seol, asks, where is the enchantment? And finally, Jillian Lavender, who's the co-founder of the London Meditation Center and the New York Meditation Center. She said when I went to see her talk at the Do Lectures in Wales last summer, do what feels charming, avoid what doesn't. Move towards what is soft, avoid what is rough. Find pockets of charm. How beautiful is that? Pockets of charm. It brings a sense of wonder in the day-to-day. -day. And of course, don't take this, these words at face value. If you're raising children, it's going to be rough. It's not always going to be soft. That's impossible. If you're fighting for justice, same thing. There is value in hardship. I think what she means and what I mean as well is pay attention to what feels out of alignment in your body. You might be doing something really hard, but at the same time, wholeheartedly want to be on that path. That's different from forcing yourself to do something that is taking you further and further away from your core. Finally, tip number 10. How can I make this fun? If you're struggling with a task, if you're butting your head against the wall, 
take a moment, stop, walk around, ask yourself, how can I make this fun? Or how can I make this a little bit more enjoyable? And don't should yourself. I see clients all the time telling themselves, this should be easier. I shouldn't be having such a hard time. Shooting yourself is only going to make your life easier because you're in conflict with yourself instead of saying, you know what? I wish this was easier, but it's not. It's hard AF. So how can I make it more fun? How can I make it easier? Let's try to be creative. When I have a lot of laundry to fold, I'm going to choose a podcast that I've been listening to for a while. If there's a phone call I don't really want to do, I'm going to go for a walk while I make the phone call. I remember a day where I had multiple coaching sessions in a row with small breaks in between. I had low energy that day, so I decided, okay, between every coaching session, I'm going to go into bed for 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm just going to go hide underneath the covers for 10 minutes and then I'm going to get back out instead of, you know, staying at my computer answering emails or stuff like that. And then it one last example, like six or seven years ago, I was applying for design jobs. I sent my portfolio to a, a design studio and then I went over to their office and left a plant at the door with a letter that said, if you hire me, I'll be there to take care of the plant. I know that's weird. I know that's weird, but it made job application more fun. And they didn't hire me at that moment. They said they had found someone else, but a few years later, I got to work for them. And I was sitting there looking at all the plants, wondering which one was mine. Okay, that's it for today. Today was a long episode packed with tips. I hope a few of them were helpful for you. Never hesitate to let me know. By the way, I'm on Instagram at Nerds. I love to hear your feedback, to hear your biggest takeaways. And you can also share them on Spotify. There's an option if you scroll down to just comment your thoughts on this episode. I love to read them. And if you're stuck and need help figuring out what's next and going all in, go to selfgrowthnerds.com slash the audacity and you'll be able to book a call with me and we'll talk about what it would be like to work together, how my approach can help you get clear on what you want for your life and develop the courage to move forward without hesitation, without constant self-doubt, and finally make progress towards creating the life that you really want. Okay, have a beautiful week, everyone. Bye-bye! Hey! If you love what you're hearing on the self Growth Nerds podcast and you want individual help finding a new direction for your life and developing the courage to make your dreams a reality, you have to check out how we can work together on selfgrowthnerds.com or message me on Instagram at selfgrowthnerds. My clients say they would have needed that support years ago. So if you're tired of feeling like you're wasting your life, don't wait. Get in touch now. And I cannot wait to meet you.